Brian Lehrer on WNYC, live in the green space today. And remember, we're in the green, when we're in the green space, you can watch us as well as listen to us. If you want to see the live video stream of our stage here, you can go to thegreenspace.org. That's green with an E at the end of it. So the green E space, thegreenspace.org, or go to the WNYC Facebook page to catch this live stream. Now, some of you know the new WNYC podcast called Trump, Inc., where Andrea Bernstein, Ilya Meritz, and our partners at ProPublica try to solve some of the many mysteries of our president's businesses. And I think we see increasingly that private sector Trump world matters to public sector Trump world, that is, to the fortunes of the American people and our democracy, not just to Trump and his family. For example, CNN is now reporting that special counsel Robert Mueller's interest in Jared Kushner has expanded beyond his contacts with Russia and now includes his efforts to secure financing for his company from foreign investors during the presidential transition, according to people familiar with the inquiry. This is the first indication that Mueller is exploring Kushner's discussions with potential non-Russian foreign investors, including China, says CNN. Mueller's investigators have been asking questions, including during interviews in January and February, about Kushner's conversations during the transition to shore up financing for 666 Fifth Avenue, a Kushner company's back New York City office building reeling from financial troubles, according to people familiar with the special counsel investigation. And again, that from CNN's original reporting. There's also the reported plea deal that Rick Gates might strike with Mueller any time now. That's an L.A. Times report. Gates is charged with former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort in tax evasion schemes, but Gates was also with the Trump team much longer than Manafort right through the transition, so who knows what else might come out as a result of investigations into private business dealings. So those are some tidbits from today's news. The Trump Inc. podcast, in its first few episodes, has looked at how Trump is blurring the line between his presidency and his business interests, lacks money laundering controls at Trump's Taj Mahal Casino in Atlantic City. How many of you here in the green space ever, have ever been to Trump's Taj Mahal Atlantic City? This is not a, a few, a few. Okay. This is not a gambling crowd, but um, nevertheless. The overlap. A um, little, little, little bit of overlap. Um, so... My sources also tell me that a Trump Inc. is soon to come about investments in Russia. And I'll tell everybody they are also looking for tips on Trump businesses that might be newsworthy from you listening to the show today or even here in the green space. And joining me now are WNYC's Andrea Bernstein and Ilya Meritz, as well as Jesse Isinger from ProPublica, best known these days for his book, whose name I can't say on the radio. <laughs> we'll call it the Chicken Bleep Club. <laughs> and no, it's not about what Donald Trump thinks about Haiti and El Salvador. It's about government's reluctance to go after bank executives who help cause the financial crisis and things like that. But hi, Ilya. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Jesse. Hi. Hey, hi. Brian. Thanks for having me. Andrea, can I get you on a little of this news first? Mueller looking into Jared Kushner and 666 Fifth Avenue. This seems like something in your wheelhouse. Any clue what he might be looking for? Well, from the facts on the record, we already know that during the period between the election and the inauguration, Jared Kushner was meeting with bankers around the world. His uh, company, Kushner Companies, which is uh, he was the CEO of, uh, and now ha it has reverted back to his family. But the company is cash-strapped because they bought a building on Fifth Avenue, 666 Fifth Avenue, which was one of the most expensive office transactions in Manhattan building history at the time. And they have a loan coming due in a couple years, and they don't have a way to pay it. So we know that the Kushner company has been around the world looking for cash. And specifically, we know that during this transition period, Kushner was meeting with a couple of different bankers. At one point, he met with a Russian state-owned bank, and the White House said that that meeting was about the transition. The bank said the meeting was about uh, 
money for Kushner's company. We know that Kushner was also meeting with uh, Chinese bank officials. So there are a lot of questions about whether there was any separation between the president's son-in-law's business and his position as an incoming presidential advisor. Um, You've reported extensively on Manafort and the way he may have used New York real estate to possibly hide other kinds of deals he's made. Um, I don't know if you want to get into Rick Gates, who's lesser known, but indicted along with Trump, and now he might make this plea, I mean, uh, with Manafort, and now might make this (laughs) plea deal. Don't accuse me of anything, you people. (laughs) The question, though, is, does any of this lead to any potential crimes by Donald Trump or his family members? CNN says Kushner is not a target of the investigation, and the LA Times story on Rick Gates says Gates may not have anything on Trump, only on Manafort that Mueller is looking for. We just don't know because the Office of Special Counsel is pretty leak-proof. But what I think is so extraordinary is if you... Well, there's a couple of things we do know. First of all, Rick Gates in the past couple weeks has had a bunch of court appearances revolving uh, regarding changing his lawyers. And people who are experts say that that could possibly mean he is looking to make a deal with Mueller's office. There are different strands of the Mueller investigation. So there are the Manafort and Gates indictment, which were uh, for money laundering, allegedly from funds from a a Ukrainian strongman through New York real estate. And the other strand is the sort of George Papadopoulos strand, in which there are still some mysteries lingering that Papadopoulos knew very early on that the Russians had compromising information about uh, Hillary Clinton, that they were going to share it. And there are just some big questions in that indictment about who George Papadopoulos spoke to at the Trump campaign and what he told them, and if any of those people were Manafort or Gates who were working at the campaign at the time. We just don't know. But one big question is, with this Gates maneuvering, are we somehow going to get those two pieces of the puzzle linked together? Ilya, tell us about the Taj Mahal Casino in Atlantic City. This is your story. It's one of chaotic operations, massive debt, and a tendency to treat rules as more like suggestions. (laughs) Ring a bell, you say. And you mean (laughs) ring a bell from uh, how Trump acts as president? Uh, Certainly ring a bell. The thing that I've been reminded of so many times uh, working on this podcast is Donald Trump spent 50 odd years as a businessman and he's been president for just over a year. So our our thinking is he's really informed by those experiences he had over the decades with his various business projects. The reason we dug in on the Taj Mahal in particular is we thought there was something interesting about that casino that a lot of people didn't know. It wasn't the bankruptcies, although it's been in bankruptcy four times. It was the lax anti-money laundering controls. So in uh, February, it might've been March of 2015, right before, four months before Donald Trump announces his campaign for president, the Trump Taj Mahal is hit with the largest ever fine by the Treasury Department for poor anti-money laundering controls. And if you read the document, it's written in this bureaucratic language, but it's full of, it, it suggests like a certain amount of like anger and incredulity on the part of the inspectors, just all the many ways in which they should have been recording details of transactions and weren't recording those transactions and how it happened over an extended period of time. They'd been checking periodically over a 12 year span. So that really intrigued me. It seemed like something that hadn't gotten probably the play that it deserved. And when we looked into it further, what we found out is not only were there poor anti-money laundering controls at the Trump Taj Mahal in that time frame. But the New Jersey Attorney General actually brought cases and got convictions and sent people to jail for laundering money at that hotel in that time frame. What kind of money would get laundered through an Atlantic uh, City casino? Why is that the vehicle for what? Well, any kind of money that's dirty, whether it's from drugs or extortion or prostitution or some, you know, some illicit activity is money that you might want to launder. A casino is a great place to do it because there's huge volumes of cash moving around all the time. It's easier to claim that you might have won that money. 
And a casino that is known for looking the other way when you bring in a large volume of cash and then bring that cash out uh, might be a favored destination. I should just add, Donald Trump has never been tied specifically to money laundering at the Trump Taj Mahal, but there are so many accused and suspected money launderers in his orbit. We were just talking about Paul Manafort and Rick Gates. That's one of the crimes they're accused of. So is there any implication here for public policy, or is this just, oh, look at the kind of scene that Donald Trump used to preside over? I think there's a little bit more to it than that. It's not just, oh, look at the shady business this guy was involved in. It's really when you look at the span of how that casino operated over 27 odd years, it was actually hit with a huge fine for poor anti-money laundering controls right at the beginning in 1991 or 1992 as well when they were in there inspecting. And so what it says is this is someone with um, a different regard for the law from what we might expect. (laughs) Someone who didn't see an upside in cooperating with investigators or listening closely to what they had to say. I could, I mean, I think the other thing that's really important in this project, Trump Inc., we're trying to understand what is happening with the president's businesses now. And the Taj Mahal was a spectacularly uh, deeply investigated and well-documented account of a business associated with the president. So one of the things that we've been looking at is for signposts, for a roadmap ahead. How can we understand what he's doing now? Well, here's one case of his business practices. What are the common themes that we should be looking for uh, as we move forward? And we do have Andrea Bernstein, Ilya Meritz, and Jesse Eisinger from the new WNYC and ProPublica podcast, Trump Inc. If anybody here in the green space has a question for them, raise your hands. Listeners, we can take a question or two on the phones, 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692. Jesse, I gather you're working on this forthcoming Russia piece. What can you tell us as a preview without scooping yourself? Uh, sure. Well, as Andrea and Ilya have been very diplomatic, but um, the, the point of the Trump Inc. podcast is that um, not only does he have uh, this 50-year business record, but the business record is one of um, repeated catastrophic failures, bankruptcies, accusations of fraud, investigations. It was a shambolic organization um, uh, rife with incompetence and, um, and things that skirted the edge of the law. Um, what you have to understand about the central notion of the biggest scandal in the presidency today, which is the Russia investigation, is that it's inseparable from understanding his businesses. Um, you need to understand the arc of the Trump organization and Donald Trump's businesses to understand what the connection or potential connections with Russia are. And, um, and then that takes you to a question of whether there were um, nefarious connections, whether there were connections that um, ran Trump into problems, whether the Russians have something on Trump, and then therefore whether Trump is uh, donating a pro for the quid. Um, or I don't know if I had that expression. Or a quid <laughs> for the quo. Or the quo for the quid, for yes. Something. <laughs> the Washington Post reported last year Quote, the simple truth is that Trump has been hungry for Russia projects for more than three decades. He has repeatedly touted plans for a Moscow mega development and has courted a steady stream of investors from the former Soviet Union for ventures in New York, South Florida, and other locations. Trump has enjoyed playing the big guy in Moscow, as he bragged to a New York real estate publication after a November 2013 dinner with prominent business leaders. The Russian market is attracted to me. He thinks everyone's attracted. If that's true, (laughs) Jesse, what's the Russian market to begin with? What does Trump even mean by that? Well, this is what, um, and our episode, the next episode is going to be 
um, discussing Glenn Simpson's testimony. Glenn Simpson was uh, ran an investigative operation um, for hire uh, called Fusion GPS, and they investigated Trump's businesses first for Republicans, then for Democrats. Paid and, for the so-called Steele dossier, right? And what we we don't look at the Steele dossier in the um, in the episode because what's uh, what he spent most of his time on, and what is more important is the business arc. And uh, so what. Uh, Simpson's theory is, and he starts with a mystery, this guy keeps going to Russia um, and coming back with nothing. Um, he doesn't build a hotel in Russia. A lot He'd, of talk. Um, a lot of talk. Uh, there's no a lot hotels. of talk. So um, is he incompetent? Um, is he failing to strike a deal each time he goes to Russia? Well, with Trump, you can never eliminate the possibility that he's utterly incompetent. But, um, uh, but Glenn comes to realize or believe that there's something more that he is actually succeeding in these businesses, uh, these trips. Um, and what he's succeeding in is, well, you'll have to That's listen right. to the podcast. That's what we're going to be. That podcast. is the what a tease. central <laughs> mystery of this episode. Right. I should also add that in it, we spoke to a man who worked very closely with Trump at the Trump Organization in charge of getting financing uh, for 12 years. So we're, we're sort of looking at the theories of alternative financing. Huh. So without doing any spoilers, we got through our whole segment on Black Panther yesterday without spoiling the ending. <laughs> we can get through this one on our own podcast. <laughs> but one place where this traces back potentially to the election and the Mueller investigation, and you touched on it, is these nagging questions of whether Russia has something on Donald Trump. Even after the 13 indictments of Russians on Friday and Trump's kind of grudging and tacit acknowledgement that they meddled at all, he's still not criticizing Russia or Putin or vowing to take any action or even sign a sanctions bill that the Senate's already passed with 97 votes. Remember, Michael Flynn had to resign as national security advisor because the Justice Department concluded he was blackmailable by Russia. So how close can any of you come with what you've been looking into here to saying what, if anything, Russia might have on Trump? Jesse? Uh, we, uh, I mean, it's unsatisfying. We don't know. Um, what we do know is that Trump's behavior is inexplicable. This is a guy who's blustering um, uh, around the world, challenging everyone, except that he's docile um, like a uh, labradoodle for in front of Putin. Why? This is a, a great mystery. Um, and so he also has these seeming ties to Russian investors, Russian money, which we walk uh, through in the podcast um, through Glenn's research, but not just Glenn's, but uh, many other people's research. So um, it leads you to this central question. Unfortunately, we don't know. Now, Mueller is um, doing what a very competent special counsel or um, prosecutorial investigation is doing. He's flipping. So you need to flip the lower level people. This is the way you do it in a mob um, prosecution. You flip the soldiers to get to the capo, to get to the capo de tutti capi. This is the way he's working up. Now, that was there's very always good. Did you practice saying that? I, that fast? I've, <laughs> yeah, I've been giving. Did I he mention that I have a it. book? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Yes, I, mean, I can chill for it. I think it. it is really important to say, though, that you know the enterprise of this podcast is trying to figure things out. So we are quite clear that we don't have all the answers, yep. and we're hoping that with each episode and everybody's tips that they're sending us, and people are sending us a lot, so thank you, that we're going to get closer to figuring this out. So that is the project. Let's take a question from an audience member here in the green space. Hello. Uh, hello. Um, you mentioned uh, the history of the Taj Mahal regarding you know, lax money controls. But um, did you think that Trump felt politically protected then? Because he was a Democrat before he became a Republican. For him to, you know, to be so lax and declare bankruptcy so many times. I mean, where were the politicians then? Were they busy taking contributions from Trump? Ilya. Well, one of the interesting things we heard from a New Jersey state regulator uh, is that in the 90s, after the first bankruptcy, that he, the Trump Taj Mahal went into bankruptcy less than two years after it launched as the biggest casino 
ever, and it went into bankruptcy. But Donald Trump at that point owned three casinos in Atlantic City, which was the legal limit, and regulators viewed him as too big to fail. So if he were to lose his gaming license, thousands of people potentially could be out of work. It would be a catastrophe, not just for Atlantic City, but really for New Jersey. Uh, so that, that I thought was a very interesting way of looking at the position that he put himself in there in terms of uh, being close to politicians or, or people going easy on him. That may have played a role. I've read various things over the years. I wanted to keep this to the documented history of poor anti-money laundering controls. And you know, it's interesting. I mean, we think of casinos as being this like, sort of like over there kind of category of business, like a, a little bit sort of outside of the mainstream. They're financial institutions. They are regulated by the Treasury Department like any other financial institution. And the same laws apply slightly differently, but basically the same laws apply. If know your customer, know the source of funds. So disregarding that is a pretty serious dereliction of duty. And Jesse's book would probably tell us that the same laws of gambling generally apply. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, let's go to a phone call. Yair in Brooklyn. You're on WNYC. Hello. To relate to the Taj Mahal, during the election, we heard that uh, we got a little tidbit of, uh, tax, of uh, Trump's uh, tax return. We saw that he claimed that close to a billion dollars of losses on the Taj Mahal. As I understand it, those losses were actually incurred by the bondholders who lent him the money. How can you have two parties claiming the same losses for the purposes of taxes? I thought that's prima facie not possible. Either the bondholder lost a billion dollars and claims that for their losses, or Trump. How can both do it? Billy is getting all the love from the audience questions today. <laughs> I'm sorry to say I don't have an answer for that question. I do remember that news breaking at the time as well. Jesse may know something more than I do. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> I was afraid it was going to be pitched to me. I, um, it was a w weird quirk in the tax law that... Um, that we're going to have to have another guest for. Uh, uh, I'm going to throw it to someone else, but I, I can't remember exactly why, but it was a legal maneuver, a legal uh, loophole. Another question here in the green space. Hello. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm very impressed with the work that you're doing. One of the things that I was wondering, I have two questions really is, now that you're looking at this whole dense thing in such detail, I find it remarkable that there was less scrutiny during the campaign and, you know, there was this discussion of a perfect storm of social factors that got Trump elected. But one would have thought that these news outlets would have been so much more attentive to the density and, and sort of the, the nefarious quality of all of his business dealings. And then the specific question is, the Deutsche Bank uh, connection really intrigues me, and I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Thanks very much for what you're doing. Thank uh, you for your question. Who wants that? Jesse. Sure. Um, I can take it quickly, which is that um, uh, I think there was actually an, a lot of good reporting um, about Trump's business record, uh, particularly by the Washington Post, but others, uh, the New York Times did some. But um, there was so much there. One of our colleagues li likens this uh, to a DDoS attack on our psyches, like the overloading of the website by hackers. Well, we're being overloaded by um, subjects and targets for uh, investigation from Trump. There was no one scandal because there were so many. It was so overwhelming. Um, so it was much easier to understand the Hillary Clinton email scandal, which I think was a scandal, but a very minor one. Um, and then you had this, this enormity of the, the business relationships that was that kind of diffused the attention. So I don't think that there was enough attention paid, but I also do think there was um, good reporting and it just kind of um, got washed out. Um, I also think that some of these things were so outside of our experience that, you know, I mean, I covered the campaign and, and to find, you know, I remember the exact moment when the Hillary Clinton campaign issued a, a press release saying the email hacks was orchestrated by the Russians. And I was like, what? That is the weirdest thing I've ever seen in a, in a campaign. And, and, you know, I had the experience during the convention of, you know, talking to people and talking actually throughout the years to a lot of, especially young voters who were very, uh, alienated from the Hillary Clinton campaign. And we know now, as of Friday, that was a well-financed, well-orchestrated Russian uh, 
endeavor was to try to stir up those feelings. So I think that in answer to your question, things were happening that we had never experienced before and we had no basis to process them. So, um, but I agree with Jesse, the Washington Post put out a book in August of 2016 about Trump's businesses. So some of this stuff, not all of it, but some of this stuff has begun to be out there, or had begun to be out there at that time. We are just about out of time with our three guests from the new WNYC and ProPublica podcast, Trump Inc. Ilya, you want to just get a last word and tell people how they can submit tips because you are asking for tips that relate to Trump businesses in particular from the audience, right? Yeah, you can go on over to trumpincpodcast.org. Uh, you'll find a phone number if you want to leave a message. You'll find an email if you want to send us an email. You can also send us documents uh, on Signal or WhatsApp, so encrypted communication if you want to uh, share stuff with us, uh, photographs. Uh, you know, we got tips from somebody in India of this strange infomercial-like story uh, about the Trump Towers India, which we played in our first episode. This was before some of the reporting that you heard over the weekend about about Don Trump's Jr.'s project right now. Uh, so thank you if you've already tipped us. If you haven't yet and you have something to share, go to trumpincpodcast.org. We really are reading every tip. And of course, <laughs> listeners, you can subscribe to Trump, Trump Inc. Uh, to listen to wherever you get your podcast. We thank WNYC's Ilya Meritz and Andrea Bernstein and Jesse Isinger from ProPublica. Jesse's current book is also out called The Chicken Bleep Club. Thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you.